as the armored cruiser appeared to be reaching its peak in speed, firepower, and protection, innovators were still looking towards further advancement of the ship. Under the new leadership of First Sea Lord Sir Jackie Fisher, the Royal Navy began a process of modernization. The largest and most ambitious part of this program would be HMS Dreadnought, the world's first all-big-gun battleship. Even with this massive achievement, Fisher still had bolder ambitions. Seeing the armored cruiser as a cornerstone of the British Empire due to its ability to secure her sea lanes and overseas stations, Fisher began investigating further development of the ship type. The economic situation oddly favored these ships' construction. For the 1905-1906 year program for the Royal Navy stipulated only one battleship and three armored cruisers could be built. This smaller plan was brought about by funds from tax revenue being less than anticipated, deliberately delaying the construction of his new ships so that they would be built after Dreadnought was complete. Fisher hoped to address any problems that came up in Dreadnought by modifying the new class of armored cruiser. Fisher and his committee hammered four key roles that these new ships were to fulfill. One, heavy reconnaissance. The ships were meant to form the core of the light cruisers and destroyers that would scout ahead of the fleet, searching for and destroying enemy forces of this nature. Two, close support to the battle fleet. This role involved screening the battle fleet in a manner similar to the first, but providing direct supplementary support. 3. Pursuit. These ships would be faster than any before them and thus would be capable of chasing down enemy units in retreat. 4. Commerce protection. More powerful than most ships traditionally used as commercial raiders, these warships would be able to easily destroy anything they encountered that was engaged in such operations. These mission needs were previously met by armored cruisers, but Fisher and his team expected the new ships to be even better than their predecessors in these roles. It would take a very large ship to meet these requirements, and thus Fisher and his team planned to arm the ship with 12-inch guns. There was one problem with this concept. Because of the size needed to support their armament and machinery, along with their expensive cost, there was a tremendous temptation to include these ships in the line of battle with the dreadnoughts. This was not something they were suited for, as their lighter armor was not designed to hold up against battleship-grade weapons. Nevertheless, Fisher was confident that his concept was the way forward for the Royal Navy. The first class of battlecruiser would be the Invincible class, and they would shock the world almost as much as HMS Dreadnought herself had. Admiral Fisher was proud of his achievement, but his happiness quickly faded when Britain signed the Triple Entente Agreement with France and Russia. These two traditional enemies were the primary reason for the battlecruiser, as their large overseas holdings were the threats that brought about this need. Additionally, improving relations with the United States and Japan gave the British confidence that they had further overseas support. Germany, now Britain's primary rival, began a response to the British battlecruiser. Focusing less on speed and firepower and more on armor and survivability, the German battlecruisers provided a contrast to the British ones. The two began a secondary arms race, not only building massive numbers of dreadnoughts, but also battlecruisers. The Japanese, seeing the battlecruiser as a ship type that could serve their imperial interest, created their own class, making them the third power to build ships of this type. When war broke out in 1914, the British and the Germans had some of their battlecruisers scattered at distant ports. Quickly these forces were moved or reorganized, and the majority of the two nations' ships stayed in port on their respective ends of the North Sea. The battlecruiser first demonstrated its effectiveness at the Battle of Heligoland Bight, where the British were able to ambush a force of German light cruisers before enemy reinforcements could arrive. It was a crushing victory, and helped solidify the validity of the battlecruiser concept. When German Vice Admiral von Spee was finally hunted down off the Falkland Islands by two British battlecruisers several months later, the warship was again the star of the show. Chasing the German East Asiatic Squadron's armored cruisers, the British battlecruisers proved their superiority that Fisher had long argued. Even at the Battle of Dogger Bank in 1915, the sinking of the German armored cruiser Blücher seemed to solidify the notion that the battlecruiser was as successful as had been promised. Inevitably, the ship was forced into the line of battle, and at Jutland, the British lost HMS Indefatigable, HMS Queen Mary, and HMS Invincible to magazine explosions. While the real culprit behind their losses were poor ammunition handling procedures, this action threw the navies of the world into disarray, as many now questioned the true value of the battlecruiser. In reality, these ships were still very capable of fulfilling their original mission requirements. While theoretically it was possible to engage them in support of the battle fleet, they now appeared unsuited for this role. Post Jutland, the battlecruiser evolved due to a series of technological innovations that would help give rise to the fast battleship concept, a blend between the dreadnought and the battlecruiser. 
The Washington Naval Treaty slowed many plans along these lines, but as restrictions began to ease in the 30s, several ships emerged that were classified by some as battle cruisers, such as the French Dunkirk class and the German Scharnhorst class. Many naval historians have debated over whether these ships should be called battle cruisers or battleships, with each class having various specifications that challenged the pre-existing parameters of both types. Even the United States, who had up until now avoided the battle cruiser bug, save the never completed Lexington class, built the Alaska class, which much like the Scharnhorsts and the Dunkirks, created a large degree of controversy over their classification. The Second World War saw the use of these newer ships, as well as the battle cruisers that had survived the interwar treaties and scrappings. They provided useful service in hunting enemy raiders and operating with fast carrier task forces. The battle cruiser, having now survived two world wars, finally seemed to die with the battleship. Yet even this was not the end, as in the 70s, the term resurfaced when the Soviet Union built the Kirov class. Their large size and heavy missile firepower led many to resurrect the old term, and to this day, a single unit of the class, the Peter Veleki, is still in service. Against all odds, the battlecruiser continues to endure into the 21st century. As of a few days ago, we reached 250 subscribers. Thank you so much to everyone who has been supporting this channel. It is your passion and interest that makes this all worthwhile for us at Battlefleet Studios. We have big plans for the future, and we look forward to sharing more videos with you soon. There will be a giveaway at 500 subscribers, so if you haven't already done so, please subscribe and share this channel with others who have any sort of interest in naval history. Thank you all so much for watching, and here's to the next 250.